Well, a lot of depressing stuff going on in the world, but something non-depressing happened on planet Earth yesterday, which was kind of cool. There was already cool stuff happening in space, but now something cool happened on planet Earth. According to the New York Times, the first astronaut trip to orbit by a private company parachuted to a safe conclusion in the Gulf of Mexico on Sunday. It was the first water landing by NASA astronauts since 1975, when the agency's crews were still flying to and from orbit and the Apollo modules used for the historic American moon missions. Riding in a capsule built and operated by SpaceX, the rocket company founded by Elon Musk, two NASA astronauts, Robert Benkin and Douglas Hurley, splashed down near Pensacola, Florida on Sunday afternoon. The crew dragging capsule, suspended under four giant billowing orange and white parachutes, settled upright into the water at a gentle pace of 15 miles per hour at 2.48 p.m. Eastern time. Michael Hyman, the SpaceX engineer communicating with astronauts, said, on behalf of the SpaceX and NASA teams, welcome back to planet Earth and thanks for flying SpaceX. Took him an hour to, uh, to go pick them up from the water. Although NASA was the customer this time, the mission could be a first step to more people going to space for a variety of new activities like sightseeing, corporate research, and satellite repair. The goal of the space agency is to turn over to private enterprise some things it used to do. Joining us on the line to discuss is NASA Administrator Jim Bradenstein. Administrator Bradenstein, appreciate your time. Let me ask you, what do you see as the future of the cooperation between public and private when it comes to NASA? Obviously, SpaceX has plans outside of what it does with the U.S. government, but what do you see as sort of the future of cooperation here? Yeah, so you know the history. The history is NASA used to purchase, own, and operate its own vehicles. And and the way we want to go in the future is we want to enter into these public-private partnerships uh, where, where, in fact, NASA can become a customer. We want to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. But we also want to have numerous providers that compete against each other on cost and innovation and safety creating a virtuous cycle of con, you know, continuous innovation um, for more access to space than ever before. We've now done that with commercial resupply to the International Space Station. We've now done it with commercial crew to the International Space Station. And the next step is commercial space stations themselves. Ultimately, that's the direction that we need to get um, because then we can use the resources that we have to do things for which there is not yet a commercial marketplace. Things like go to the moon sustainably, and go to Mars. And, and of course, every step along the way, we're always thinking about how do we commercialize? Look, if the government is, is the only institution providing the resources, then it is a zero-sum game, and we will never progress the way we need to progress. What we need to do is we need to enable the commercial sector to come along, find customers that are not NASA, and then we need to move further and do more than we've ever been able to do before. What do you see as the timeline for something as ambitious as building a, a base on the moon or, or getting to Mars? So we're going to do our first mission with humans to the moon in 2024. And we're not just landing the next man, we're landing the first woman. Um, and that's uh, on the agenda of the president of the United States. Um, I think we can we can be sustainable on the moon by 2028, but we will have our, our, our next humans on the moon by 2024. When I say sustainable, what I don't mean is a permanent human presence. What I mean is we're able to have access to any part of the moon anytime we want, which of course is critically important for a whole host of reasons that go beyond just research, uh, but also it is it is very important for research and discovery and exploration. But more than anything, Ben, what we need to learn how to do is we need to learn how to live and work on another world for long periods of time using the resources of that other world, in other words, the moon. So we have to use the, the hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the south pole of the moon Water ice represents air to breathe and water to drink, but it's also hydrogen. Hydrogen, of course, is the same rocket fuel that powered the space shuttles. It's available in hundreds of millions of tons on the moon. And then we need to take that knowledge for how to be sustainable, sustainable on the moon. We need to take that knowledge onto Mars. The challenge with Mars, Ben, is that Mars and Earth are on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. When we go to Mars, we have to be willing to stay. And the president has said, we're going to put an American flag on Mars, and that's what we intend to do. As a sci-fi fan, there are all sorts of theories about how we balance private corporate needs and, and, and business with governmental influence. How do you see that balance playing out as we explore new worlds? Yeah, so right now on the International Space Station, we are, make no mistake, it is there because of taxpayer investment. Make no mistake. But also, we have to think about what are we doing on the International Space Station that enables the taxpayer to remove itself over time from that solution set. So right now we're looking at advanced materials. 
uh, things like Zbland, which think of very pristine fiber optic networks um, that, that you know, actually you don't have to have cable repeaters every quarter of a mile. Um, they're so pristine that it, you know, it really changes the business case and drives down the cost of laying fiber in a city, for example. Um, we're, we're creating with artificial materials, um, you know, materials that are so thin, they're one atom thick. What does that mean? That means we can create things like an artificial retina for the human eyeball so that people who have macular degeneration don't have to go blind, but instead they'll be able to continue to see. Um, we're also looking at, you know, industrial biomedicines, things like the ability to use adult stem cells, your own skin cells, for example, to create your own human tissue uh, for regenerative medicine, for you know, eventually being able to create your own organs out of your own adult stem cells. And we can only do that in the microgravity of space because of the value that microgravity has. If you try to do that in the gravity well of Earth, the tissue would just go flat. But there's so much more. We're talking about compounding pharmaceuticals in microgravity and creating immunizations for things like salmonella and pneumonia in space, things that you can't do on the Earth. So, um, but the, the goal here is to prove on the International Space Station that we can commercialize these things, then we allow private capital to flow and finance ultimately what will eventually be uh, continuous human habitation in low Earth orbit for the duration, then NASA, of course, can go onto the moon, always thinking about what are the, what are the commercial benefits. But uh, this is so important for your audience. Right now, you and I are talking uh, via satellite. Um, we think about all the things that NASA has contributed to society over time. Uh, direct TV, dish network, internet broadband from space. I come from Oklahoma. A lot of rural Oklahomans would not have internet if it wasn't for internet broadband from space. Uh, XM radio, for example, but also the way we navigate with GPS, the way we produce food. We're increasing crop yields, reducing water usage, the way we produce energy in a very clean way. Um, the way we predict weather, the way we understand climate, the way we uh, do national security and disaster relief. So many of these benefits um, are born from this little agency called NASA that are so important um, that we can't dismiss that this, this is an investment by the American taxpayer. Our goal is to always commercialize, but we cannot dismiss all of the wonderful things that have come from these programs. Well, perhaps you can talk for a second about the sort of cost savings that are available because of the use of a private enterprise in situations like this? Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about the space shuttles, it was a, they, they were absolutely magnificent instruments of engineering, uh, marvels of technology, but also very, very expensive. And, and, and the government would just purchase, own, and operate them, which of course guaranteed that they would stay very, very expensive. With the new model, uh, again, what we're looking for is we want to, we want to do development with a commercial partner, um, once it is developed, we want to step back and we want to buy, you know, we want to buy a rocket every time we need one, or we want to buy a seat to space every time we need one. But we expect those, those, those providers to go get customers that are not NASA. And if they're willing to do that, our costs go down and the benefits to humanity go way up because there's far more capital outside of NASA than there is inside of NASA. So these partnerships really do drive down the cost. You know, I want to also be clear, you know, we haven't had a human spaceflight program from American soil since 2011, which was when the last space shuttle retired. So we've been nine years without a human spaceflight program. Since then, we've been, we've been buying seats on Russian Soyuz rockets at, a, at the tune of about $90 million per seat at this point. Um, and now we're going to be buying seats at closer to $50 million per seat. So it's an American capability. The, the money goes to the United States of America. And, and, and of course, the cost is far less than it would be if we were buying from Russia. Well, thank you so much, Administrator Brian and Congratulations. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that clip from The Ben Shapiro Show. If you did, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you stay up to date on all of our future content.